Hi everyone, I'm back after a long time with another video as part of my Python tips and tricks series where I talk about little things that do not fit as part of my regular uh, series, but I still think they're relevant and useful for you guys, especially the ones uh, coding with Python and looking at machine learning and deep learning. And more importantly, if you're looking at image processing or image analysis, then you may find some information useful from this video. Now, why am I doing this? I get a lot of questions uh, from others and I also ask myself about whether a given problem should be approached using traditional or conventional machine learning or should I be doing deep learning? And uh, uh, usually if I have enough data, training data, then I don't even think, right? I mean, this is a deep learning topic. Also, sometimes if you don't have a lot of training data. Maybe there is a pre-trained deep learning model that can actually get you 80% there and you can go from there, uh, the remaining 20%. Now, uh, traditional machine learning do not underestimate uh, where you're actually doing feature engineering, where you're extracting various features and quickly solving problems. That doesn't require a lot of training data, but this video is not about whether to use traditional machine learning or deep learning, but I just wanted to show you the power of deep learning in general and also the power of feature engineering. So if you know exactly what digital filters are useful for a specific application, then go ahead and engineer your features. But most of us do not know that. For example, in this case, I created a synthetic example, synthetic image. As you can see on the left-hand side, it shows like a bunch of uh, horizontal and vertical stripes. Now, if you want to extract, okay, what is the diameter of the circles within which you have the horizontal uh, bands, then you need to extract the that specific region. And for that, uh, a filter like, for example, a Gabor filter, Gabor filter that you see on the screen can be very much useful where you apply a horizontal filter and or a filter you know kernel where the the kernel is aligned along the horizontal direction and it extracts only the ones that are in the horizontal and now you can do tricks like okay uh, i don't know uh, blurring the image and trying to get the circles out of this but as you can see on the screen itself by changing the orientation of the filter we are extracting the relevant features so if you're good at feature engineering, great. If not, on the right-hand side, you see feature learning. So deep learning is nothing but feature learning, right? So you don't know what feature uh, features are useful. So you throw a whole bunch of data at uh, the algorithm and then it does the training, forward pass, backward, backward pass, right? So it does all the training and at some point you're like, okay, I like the accuracy that I see, which basically means I'm good with the digital filters that you learned. That's what you're 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 telling the uh, algorithm, because all the algorithm is doing is updating the weights in these kernels, right? And these kernels are nothing but digital filters. So, all of this hopefully will make sense uh, in the next maybe 10 minutes. I don't want to make this a very long video. I'll share the code so you can experiment with your own images. It's very fun, especially if you. Uh, are getting started with this deep learning machine learning topic. Okay, so on the left hand side, we have feature engineering where we are designing what features we would like to extract. Uh, and on the right hand side, you have feature learning where we are like, I don't know, <laughs> just take the VGG16 pre trained model and show me all the features from a specific layer. Okay, let's jump into the code and again look for the link below for uh, the code and also please hit the subscribe button while you're at it and also if you're feeling extra generous hit the thanks button right next to the subscribe button okay guys let's jump into the code now and you can run this code wherever i'm just using the spider ide it doesn't matter what ide you use the reason i use spider ide is it makes a very good teaching tool for me uh, I could have used Python notebooks, but then notebooks I think is more academic. And if you really want to get into a bit of a production, uh, you want to get a feel for real Python coding, then you can go to VS Code and other other uh, IDEs. But uh, for teaching purposes, this is great because I can look at the variables right here, plots right here. So it makes it makes everyone's life easy. Okay, so the first thing first, I am going to run load an image and the image looks like this, right? I mean, you already saw it in the screen. I literally put this, created this image in uh, in uh, PowerPoint just by drawing rectangles and stuff. So it took it took about 15 minutes for me to come up with this, but it's useful. I'll include this as part of uh, as part of this GitHub. Uh, otherwise, you can you can find it yourself uh, wherever. Okay, so this is our input image, and now let's go ahead and define uh, a Gabor kernel. And Gabor is a convolutional uh, kernel that 
it's it's a think of it as a mixture of spatial and also frequency combined into one because it has a uh, kernel size it has a sigma for your gaussian it's got theta where you rotate the kernel and lambda gamma and phi like uh, uh, the phase shift and so on so this is this is a great uh, feature extractor and typically the way you use this if you don't know exactly what orientation features are uh, useful you just change the kernel size like three different times and change the sigma uh, again uh, three five 11, 27, whatever, change it multiple times and change the theta all the way from zero to 180 degrees, change the lambda also similarly and gamma is, uh, gamma is, uh, uh, I don't wanna get into the details of this, but basically it's the aspect ratio, right? Is it a very long aspect ratio kernel or is it a more circular uh, kernel? But you can just go in steps and also fee and generate like I don't know, 200 different uh, kernels and apply all of those and use random forest for example and then random forest tells you what which ones are working fine and then take only those for your real production environment. So that's just a uh, strategy that you can use with uh, Gabor. But for this exercise, I just defined some of these uh, uh, parameters right there. Look at the theta. This is the most important one for now. Uh, it's pi. And how does it look like? We'll have a look at it in a second. So in OpenCV, you can actually get, get Gabor kernel right there. And this is how you define it. There is a kernel size. This is a 2D kernel. So you have a, a five by five kernel right there and sigma, theta, lambda, gamma, uh, phi, and uh, uh, K type is 32F. So this is how you apply, you define your kernel. And when you define that, you actually effectively have a five by five kernel. If I open this, you see these are the values. This is, this is a digital filter, right? When you are training deep learning, uh, typically the filter size is three by three. So in this case, uh, I define this as five by five. So let's leave that and let's have a look at how the kernel actually looks like. So when I plot it, you can come here and you see the kernel size is, uh, the K size is only five. That's why it looks pretty, pretty bulky broad right there. But I think in our case, it should work. Uh, let's go ahead and apply this kernel onto our input image and you probably know how to do that in OpenCV you can actually do cv.filter2d that means it applies the convolution kernel on top of your uh, to your image so it actually multi does the multiplication and then it gives you the output and all I'm doing here is plotting the output so let's go ahead and do that again I'm skipping through all the basics I'm not explaining why I'm changing BGR to gray and all that stuff you probably know that there you go. So this is a kernel that is uh, oriented at 90 degrees, let's say aligned along with the image. Now, if I change this to by two, you know, it's rotated by 90 degrees, either clockwise, clock, uh, anti-clockwise doesn't matter in our case, but let's go ahead and look at the new kernel now. And there you go, the horizontal. And as you can imagine, we should only see the horizontal features in the image and there you go. And why am I only looking at these little lines and exactly this is what is controlled by your kernel size and sigma. So for example, let's uh, change the kernel size to, I don't know, 50. So it's a pretty large kernel, 50 by 50. So the computation is a bit slow, but it's okay for us. This is not uh, a large image. So let's go ahead and now you can see how the kernel is. Now this is a 50 by 50 and now you can see the actual digital uh, filter right there and if you apply that onto your image by not changing much you can see all the horizontal stuff gets uh, picked up again you can play with uh, changing the feed like which is the phase shift instead of uh, instead of this being at the center everything will be moved to the side and so on so change all the parameters and see how things uh, change now this is feature engineering i as an expert am trying to engineer the features that gives me these uh, this output. In this example, this is easy because I know my image, there is like horizontal, there is vertical, but more natural images are a bit more complicated. So a specific kernel guessing what works is not going to work. That's exactly where feature learning, deep learning is very important. So if I switch to VGG16, again, this is, uh, you can think of this as an antique uh, deep learning architecture, but I, I absolutely love it because it works great whether you're trying to do segmentation, classification, it doesn't matter. It's very simple, uh, not too slow. It actually works great. And luckily there are a lot of, uh, I should say pre-trained uh, VGG16 models out there, whether you're using TensorFlow or Keras or 
uh, I don't know, it's up to you, PyTorch, uh, whatever framework, you will find a VGG16 model pre-trained on ImageNet dataset, uh, database. That's exactly what I'm using here. So I'm importing VGG16, and that's from TensorFlow. First of all, let's import the model, and I'm using uh, VGG16, importing it from my TensorFlow, and I'm in, in a, I'm defining my model. I'm trying, I'm struggling to find words today. Okay, so I'm defining the model, which is VGG16, and I want to download the weights. By putting the weights equal to ImageNet, it actually downloads the pre-trained model, because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to train another new model because I only have one image. I'm not gonna train it, but I'm going to extract features from this image by applying this pre-trained model, and ImageNet has millions of images, so the trained model, VGG16 model, should know, should be already optimized for uh, extracting the best features, okay? At extracting the best features. So let's go ahead and define the model with ImageNet. If this is the first time you're doing it, you will see down here that it's downloading the ImageNet weights. I just did that before recording this tutorial. And let's go ahead and print the summary. As you probably know, VGG16 takes 224 by 224 by three size images and the output is going to be one of the thousand classes. Why thousand? Because ImageNet has about one uh, exactly 1,000 different classes. If you're actually uh, trying to classify this image, then this model is great. But that's not what we are trying to do. We are trying to take this model, chop it off somewhere in the middle, maybe at block three convolutional two, and only take the output of convolution two, where you have 256 different, uh, 256 different uh, features. That's what these means, right? You know probably what these are. This is, uh, 224 by 224 pixels and 64 different features that you're actually getting. This is 128 different features, 256 different features. So it's up to you where you would like to chop it off. A good exercise would be look at the output from here and see how the features look like and take another one from deeper and look at the features and see how the richness increases as you go deeper and deeper because it gets more and more features. Uh, uh, identified. Okay, so with that information, let's go ahead and take uh, extract or, or redefine our model. So my, let's look at our layers and filters and biases and uh, let's actually print that layer name right here. So the first layer that we are going to look at is called block one con one. What is block one con one? Block one convolutional one right there, right? So you see this layer now, let's go ahead and just extract features from here. And uh, let's, uh, in fact, let's look at how that layer looks like, not extract before even applying. What do we mean by this convolution layer? And remember the kernel sizes in this case are three by three kernels. So when we look at the output, all of these would be three by three. So this is basically plotting the, the layer right there uh, in an eight by eight matrix. That's what you're seeing. So there you go, eight, eight, 64, so we have total 64 features. And this is how the features are, yeah? So look at the values right there. And these are all digital filters that are going to be applied onto our image. When I say applied, a convolutional application, yeah? I'm pretty sure most of you are thinking, why is this guy explaining basic stuff? But uh, hopefully some of you are benefiting from this, uh, from this uh, lecture. Okay, so define a, now let's define a new truncated model. Now that we see this model, let's actually take a model that actually goes like one layer, two layer, three layers deep, and then just take up to that point and then uh, look at the output from those layers. So that's exactly what we are doing right there. So one, three, and six, and I'm defining a new model and let's go ahead and plot the summary. So you can see the output that I'm going to get will have 128 different features. So let's plot all of them and let's look at them one by one and see how even without tuning anything, without doing anything, I'm just taking the existing convolutional layers pre-trained on ImageNet and applying onto my image and you'll see the features right away. Okay, so let us go ahead and load our image and change the image size to 224 by 224 because that is the size that it needs to be as an input for this model. And let's convert that into a NumPy array and expand the dimensions so it is ready to be uh, provided as an input to the VGG16. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you shouldn't be watching this video. You should have some idea. So I all I did was read an image and get that image into this shape instead of just 
uh, whatever the image size is, I'm changing the image uh, into one by 224 by 224 by three. Now it has the right dimensions to go into my VGC16 network. And now let's actually apply our short model onto our input image. And now we'll get the output. Now, what does feature output look like? It's a NumPy array of these three. And if I open this, you can see each of these is 224 by 224 by 64, 112, 112, 64, 56, 56, 128. Can we actually find those here? 212, 224, 224, 64, 112, 112, 64, and 56, 56, 128. I hope we'll see that the output from this layer has much more rich features compared to the initial one. Let's plot them. That's the lesson here so let's go ahead and plot these and let's go to our plot okay so there you go that's the first that's the second so let's go ahead and look at the first one this is the this is the first one where it was 224 this is the first one where it still doesn't know what the features are but it's actually trying to understand what the edges are right you see how it's actually detecting all the edges uh, i hope you can see that and let me uh, i'll try to digitally zoom in there uh, while recording the video, but you can see how it's actually detecting all the edges. That's why you're seeing this round stuff, round features over there. And you can see some of the features that are being highlighted uh, over there. And now let's look at the next level features. There you go. Now you start to see a bit more information. You see how these circles are kind of extracted right here, but you still have like edges, which is also useful information by the way, and let's go to the third one right here. Now you see more things are emerging. This is much better uh, easily identified now, these, these circles, and, and also the lack of circles is also easily identified right there. And if you keep mapping going down and down and down, and at some there comes a point where if you have a dog image, then it knows that, hey, this is a dog, right? So now you have a nice, very rich feature map. This is exactly how deep learning works. Okay, so what's the point of this entire tutorial? There is feature engineering, there is feature learning. Feature engineering is great if you don't have a lot of data sets and you only have a handful of images and you don't have a good pre-trained model and you just want to engineer a couple of things. Let's say you're looking at different layers. Uh, I don't know, paint uh, layers or, or uh, geographic layers, like you know they are horizontal, you want to extract different layers, then you can tune your Gabor filter, Gabor kernel to that horizontal layer. Uh, but uh, but if you don't know, if, if, if your image is a bit more complicated, you have a lot, uh, even if you don't have a lot of data, in this case, I don't have anything. I only have one image, right? But I started to extract these. Now this image, this what that you're seeing on the screen can be an input to our random forest or support vector machines, it doesn't matter. Uh, for image segmentation or classification. I've done a couple of videos on this topic, so please go ahead and check those videos. I'll try to leave the link as part of the description down below uh, or up here. I still am trying to figure out how, how, to, how to get all of this stuff uh, done in YouTube, but look for the link up there uh, on the corner. Uh, Anyway, thank you guys uh, very much for patiently watching. I was hoping this video to be like between five to 10 minutes, but I'm pretty sure this went much longer than 10 minutes. And uh, if you're still li listening to me, that means you kind of uh, found this to be educational. Do not forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you.